Hi, uh, so once again to pick up on uh, some topics that are doing the rounds in the news at the moment. I um, thought what we'd do um, now is talk about um, confidentiality, privacy and whistleblowing. Um, we'll be talking about NDAs, non-disclosure agreements um, and super injunctions. Um, again, this isn't to do with any specific case, although it's obviously inspired by the headlines. Um, first of all, what do we mean by confidential information? Um, Confidentiality can arise in a number of ways. Sometimes um, it's just taken that some information is confidential. Um, you know, your relationships with somebody else, uh, you know, what goes on in your own home. Uh, say, for instance, you employ a nanny or a babysitter, um, even if there's no contract. They are not supposed to disclose, you know, what you do, you know, what, what you get up to at home, what, you know, what, <laughs> what your shopping list is, anything like that. Um, because basically, you know, it's a reasonable expectation of privacy. Um, also things like, you know, what goes on in the bedroom, um, you know, this is something that's cropped up a lot. Remember all those super injunctions and injunctions with football players? And that was all brought on the basis that, you know, it stops kiss and tell type memoirs because they say, ah, no, you know, it's clearly understood that, uh, you know, what, go what goes on behind closed doors is private. Uh, there can also be uh, contractual obligations of privacy. Um, sometimes... You'll see that in your employment contract, you know, anything that you find out at work, you know, customer databases, secret recipes, all that sort of thing. Um, that's treated as confidential. Uh, as confidential. Um, and sometimes you get specific things called non-disclosure agreements. Um, all they are are contracts, um, you know, as the agreement suggests. So in exchange for something, and that can be for money, or it can be as part of a settlement, um, you know, in potential litigation, or even after litigation has been issued. Uh, it's not uncommon, actually, to say, right, you know, this litigation is settled on terms confidential to the parties, because, you know, people might not want to know what they are willing to pay out in damages in case it affects their negotiating position in other cases. Um, so there might be lots of situations where somebody basically is under an obligation of confidentiality, whether that's a reason at common law, um, as part of a general employment contract, or as part of a specific non-disclosure agreement. Can you ever breach that? And if so, what are the consequences? Well, yes, potentially so. Um, there's always been this saying that there's no confidence in iniquity. That means you can't uh, basically use an obligation of confidence to cover up wrongdoing. Um, but that's now been put on a statutory basis. Um, now, people watching this will know that, you know, I tend to do this. These are all one take, should be fairly obvious and pretty much unrehearsed. However, I do have some notes. So when I say notes, I'm basically plagiarising an article I wrote on this a little while back. Um, so I'm going to talk about something called the Public Interest Disclosure Act 1998, or as we say in the trade, PIDA. And that's designed to actually give a statutory basis to do protection for whistleblowers. Um, it applies to workers. Uh, worker is defined very, very broadly. I won't get into the employment law aspects of that, but that's things like agency staff. Uh, and what that states is that no one should suffer a detriment as a consequence of making a protected disclosure. And a detriment can be anything, uh, any form of negative treatment. I mean, the obvious thing is like, you know, being fired, but it could just be like you get ostracised at work. You know, your work colleagues shun you and the bosses don't do anything about you, about it. Um, and if you do suffer a detriment as a result of a protected disclosure, you can bring a claim under the Employment Rights Act. Um, and there's a range of remedies there, uh, from getting your job back um, to financial compensation. Um, so, OK, so what's a protected disclosure? Um, well, first of all, there needs to be a disclosure within the meaning of the Act, and it has to be a qualifying disclosure. Um, and the disclosure has to be made to particular people or organisations. Um, so what's a qualifying disclosure? Uh, well, it can be, you know, that a criminal offence has been committed, is being committed, or likely to be committed. That's a fairly obvious one. Um, that a person or organisation has failed, is failing, or is likely to fail to comply with any legal obligation to which they are subject. Um, that a miscarriage of justice has occurred, uh, is occurring, or is likely to occur. That the health or safety of any individual has been, is being, or likely to be endangered. You see a pattern here, don't you? Um, that the environment has been, is being, or likely to be damaged, or that information tending to show any matter falling within any one of the preceding paragraphs has been, is being, or is likely to be deliberately concealed. So it just doesn't just cover up bad behaviour. It also, you know, sorry, it doesn't just cover bad behaviour. It covers cover-ups. Um, now, 
when we say about wrongdoing, do we mean like illegal activities or just morally wrong activities? Um, well, originally it was intended just aiming at criminal wrongdoing. Um, but, you know, the tribunals, employment tribunals, they do seem to be getting more receptive to the idea that moral and ethical failures can also uh, fall within a qualifying disclosure. Um, so, you know, what do we mean by serious failure? Um, well, it's dealt with on a case by case basis. Um, but generally, any disclosure that's in the general public interest, and remember, that's not the same as of interest to the public. It's very similar to the defamation test there. Um, that, but that would be prote protected. Uh, so long as the person doesn't make the disclosure for personal gain. Um, and who you tell is a relevant factor. So you might be protected if you tell the police or a regulator or some sort of body like that, you know, social services. But just going straight to the press might not be. Um, but, you know, who, who are the sort of, you know, permissible recipients? Um, generally, um, disclosure should be made to the following types of people. Um, and also, there's sort of an order in which you do it, because uh, if you don't get satisfaction, you can move on. Uh, but employer or other reasonable person. So the first place, the problem at work, the first person you go to is, you know, your employer, your boss. Uh, you know, there's a health and safety problem. Uh, this isn't happening, or somebody's doing this at work, or somebody, you know, we, we've got a potential suspect employee who's up to all sorts of things with, you know, the junior staff, for instance. Um, and once you've made that disclosure, you can also disclose further, for instance, um, you know, the auditors of the company or the directors of the company. Um, so that's your first port of call. You can also uh, report to uh, a government minister or member of parliament, going to your local MP and saying, I, you know, there's an issue, that's always protected. Um, but there's a list, actually, of um, permissible uh, persons and organisations. That's available on the government website. Um, just do that whistleblowing list of prescribed people and bodies, bodies and it will it will set out everything there. So, you know, it, it is things like, you know, social services, child protection, that sort of thing. Um, but what about other organisations? Well, let's say you, you know, you go to your employer and nothing's happened. You know, it all gets covered up. Everything's carrying on as before. You know, this is, you know, what's going on here. So you, you go to your MP or a minister and say, oh, this is what's going on at work. And nothing happens and nothing happens. Well, in that particular case, you might then be able to just go public with it. Uh, but again, so long as it's not for financial gain, so make sure you don't go to the newspaper and they say, this is a brilliant story, thanks for that, here's £10,000, because that would remove you from the protection. Um, there have got to be allegations of fact, uh, not opinion. Again, you see there's a bit of parallel here with um, defamation. Uh, but, you know, so just expressing a negative opinion as to the conduct of an employer, that's not protected. My bosses are right, you know what. That's not protected disclosure. My boss is, you know, fiddling the customers and, you know, putting lead paint in baby food. That would be okay. Um, allegations can be information. So you don't actually need to show that um, the wrongdoing has actually, you know, definitely happened. Um, you can report that there's a rumour at work that, for instance, a company is involved in dangerous practices. Because, you know, the, 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 you know the pub, there is a public interest in this sort of thing coming to lie. And if, you know, the worst comes to worst, the company's cleared, well, you know, no harm done, apart from all the reputational damage, of course. Uh, but at least you would be protected in that instance. Um, you've got to have a reasonable belief that it's happening. Um, if it's criminal activity, um, you don't actually need to specify in technical terms what the law is. Um, you know, a, a general layperson's assessment is, is enough. Um, and it also, it, it, if you think it's a crime, even if it turns out it's not, you know, you think there's a breach of health and safety law, and it actually turns out that, you know, that is that is permitted, the dumping sewage, well, we're allowed to now. Yeah, so, you know, it's still reasonable to suspect that that was a crime. Um, now, remember, it's only the disclosure that's protected, not the way you got the information. So if you, you know, bug your boss's office or you break into the filing cabinet or you hack the computer system, that wouldn't be protected. It's, it, 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 it's the information, not the way you gather it. Um, there used to be a requirement that you had to make the disclosure in good faith. Uh, I mean, that was always a bit hard to you know, prove, but you'd get people going, oh, you're only doing this because you're a disgruntled ex-employee or, you know, something like that. Um, as it happens now, um, so long as it's a protected disclosure, it doesn't really matter if you're just doing it to cause trouble for your ex-bosses, although when it comes to compensation, 
your motivation can be taken into account. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be your employer. Um, you can uh, disclose on third parties as long as it comes to your attention. You know, say for instance, you know one of your suppliers or subcontractors is up to something. Um, then again, you can actually um, report that. Um, and here's the thing: when we're talking about non-disclosure agreements, even if there is a specific non-disclosure agreement in place, if it's a protected disclosure, it doesn't matter, and you can't be sued on f for the breach of the NDA. Okay, so that's that's something that might be very very relevant. Um, and what's a detriment? It's very very widely defined. I mean, it's not just dismissal or demotion or you know not getting a pay rise or a promotion. Uh, it's any negative consequences. So um, if they give you know if they give you grief for making the you know the disclosure, you get hassle from your bosses or even your fellow employees. Um, that's a detriment. Um, and actually, interestingly, you can actually also claim against any individual that gives you a hard time. So say there's somebody at work who goes, oh, you shouldn't have said that, or look at all the trouble you've caused. You can actually claim against them as uh, personally as well. So that's a useful thing to remember. Um, there's also, right, this is in addition to the Act, because the Act does cover a lot of different types of people. Uh, but some people are excluded, because some people aren't workers as a matter of law. Like the police, for instance, they're technically, you know, holders of offices under the Crown. Uh, also, you know, intelligence and security services, they have very specific legislation saying PIDA doesn't apply to them. But there is, um, there's a common law public interest defence to whistleblowing. There isn't to breaching the Official Secrets Act. That's always been something people have argued that there should be a public interest defence there, but there isn't specifically. Um, but you do have certain Article 10 rights under the ECHR. That's your right to free speech. Um, and it's also a breach of Article 14 to treat people differently because of, quote, status. Uh, and what was interesting about that is um, a judge, who and judges are office holders under the Crown, um, a judge was actually able to bring a whistleblowing claim successfully, um, despite being an office holder. Uh, and that was... You know that that was a common law claim. Um, you know, on the back of the Article Ten point. Um, so that'd be interesting, really, to test the waters on that. So maybe somebody who even is in the security services. Um, you know, could this be a backdoor way of getting a sort of um, official secrets act defence? Who knows? Um, but yeah, so so that's sort of one aspect of it. Now, let's say, for instance, there wasn't anything contractual um, or any obligation. But somebody's about to leak some information. Well, you can apply for injunctions on the back of uh, privacy. Uh, unlike defamation, because defamation you can never get what we call prior restraint. You can never get an injunction to say, this person is about to defame me, or this article's about to be published, stop it. Um, it's published and demand, uh, be damned. That's always been the idea with defamation. But with confidential information and privacy, you can get, um, it's a Kia Timet, if you want to use some Latin, which we're not allowed to, injunction, uh, sort of before the time, um, to prohibit that. And actually, if, it, if it's mixed defamation and confidence, then you can get injunctions there. I mean, there was a case where basically somebody was a nanny and they reported on the behaviour of these their celebrity employers. Now, the employer said, actually, most of that's not true. You know, they were sort of saying all sorts of salacious things were going on. They said, that's not true. And they said, well, if you're saying it's not true, that's defamation, you can't get your injunction. I said, no, but there's still the breach of confidence from the fact that Nanny shouldn't be saying what we were doing, even if, even if it was true. Um, and they actually allowed the injunction in that particular case. So, you know, again, it seems to be expanding. Um, but, you know, so you get an injunction and you go along and you say, look, this is confidential information. And what you'd normally do is you do what we used to call ex parte, or now we call it without notice. It's one of the few times where you go to court, you make an application saying I want an injunction and you don't tell the other side. Uh, because the idea is if you tell the other side, they might get the information out there before you get the injunction. And there's a rule in um, what we call equity, because um, injunctions are equitable remedies. And we'll have to talk some time about the difference between equity and common law. Uh, but equity will not act in vain. So one of the arguments is there's no point doing an injunction because the cat's out of the bag. Um, that's not an absolute, because the mere fact that you could buy spy catcher in all those years ago, they still put the injunction in place because otherwise there would be a temptation for people just to go, well, I can get, I can avoid getting an injunction just by preemptively breaching any potential injunction and then go to court and say, well, it's pointless now, I've already done it. And then that, you know, that would spread, well, you can't stop me knocking this wall down because I've already knocked it down, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so when you apply for an injunction, 
um, you don't tip off the other side. Generally speaking now, because there are a number of applications you do without notice, you know, ex parte, uh, because, you know, you're in a hurry. But what they said now is, in this age of email, you can at least let the other side know that you're going to court and see if they want to pitch up. Uh, but in this particular case, you make it without notice. And you go along court and say, look, I need an injunction to stop this information being published. And this is why. And when you appear ex parte, um, you have to actually put any points that the other side, as lawyers, we have to say, here are all the arguments the other side could make to, against us. Um, and that's a, an interesting duty on us because we have to effectively second guess what the other side would say. And sometimes it's really weird. I remember once where somebody did actually tip me off on an injunction. And I said, well, I, I think I prefer you just going along because you'll have to say all the points I would have made and you'll probably be better at it than I will. So I'll, I'll just wait till the return date. Um, and the return date is if you do get an injunction without the other side being represented. So they go, OK. And usually they'll say, well, OK, because in terms of the balance, if we don't give this injunction, it's very hard to put a cat back in a bag, whereas a cat can just stay in a bag for a couple of days. Although the courts do recognise that news is a perishable commodity. So they won't automatically just say, well, look, you know, what's the harm done? They've just got to wait a few days. But the court will then do what we call a return date. They'll say, right, here's your temporary injunction. Now come back here in like maybe three days' time, or perhaps longer if the parties agree, or even shorter if the parties go, well, hang on a second, you know, we need this sorting now. This information is about to expire. Um, then you come back and there's a hearing with the other side represented and you argue again whether the injunction should continue. Um, what if, though, the mere existence of somebody applying for an injunction tips everybody off that something's not right? You know, it's like, well, hang on a second, why is this celebrity trying to get an injunction against this particular person? What's the story behind that? So, you can apply for a so-called super injunction. And that's an injunction where the mere existence of the injunction itself is also something that isn't allowed to be disclosed. So you've seen these things where you get anonymised judgments, you know, ABC and XYZ as, you know, applicant and respondent. That's one way of keeping confidence. But sometimes say, well, hang on a second, it's fairly obvious. You know, the, the applicant is the presenter of a well-known <laughs> sort of television show and the respondent is a footballer who's just won some trophy. Um, you know, that can, that, that can give the game away. So you'll basically say, right, this injunction needs to be so super, super secret. Um, that even the mere existence of the injunction can't be recorded anywhere. So that's a super injunction. I have actually obtained a super injunction once, uh, but ironically, obviously, I can't talk about it. Although it was quite funny, because when I got it, the solicitor said, so that's brilliant, Put a, can you write us something for the website? And it's like, I think you've missed the point. But that was effectively, that was in a what was effectively a blackmail attempt. So the courts were highly sympathetic. Um, and that was one of these where, um, you know, did it by telephone. Because, you know, injunctions, you need them urgently. Um, sometimes you can just run down to your local court if it's open and say, just stick us in front of a judge. Uh, sometimes, like this happened a lot with the old trade union things, where people say, you know, there's a strike being called. We need the strike called off because we're saying it's not compliant with the rules. And you'd end up sort of, you know, having the argument, you know, in the judge's like hallway. Uh, there is actually, though, there's a, there's a telephone number because there's always a duty judge on call at the um, high court. Um, so you can always ring that and say, look, I need an injunction. Uh, and sometimes you'll sort of say, uh, I need the injunction now. I will give an undertaking to get all the relevant paperwork to you as soon as we've had this this conversation. But I'm just going to tell you what it's about now. And I promise that there is something behind this and I'll send you the papers through. Um, so anyway, so hopefully that's sort of interesting and, you know, but it might be useful for you if you've got any super secrets or, you know, you, you know <laughs> the nanny's about to do a kiss and tell book. Um, but yeah, so now when you're reading in the press and speculating as to what might be going on behind the scenes, well, now, now you know.